this is the first message in our Advent season sermon series. As we prepare again for the first Advent or first coming of our Savior and today's message as heard in the songs and in the prayers focuses on hope. We're going to start this message um, in a place where it seemed like all hope was lost, and that's the garden. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, this is after Adam and Eve have fallen for the lies of the serpent, and God pronounces his judgment. But he does something else. And in verse 15, he says this, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is the first messianic prophecy. The first prophecy that speaks of the coming of the one who's going to make things right after the fall. Some scholars call this, or theologians call this, the proto-evangelium, first gospel, because we see the victory of Christ prophesied over the enemy, over sin, over death, right in this verse. So we begin to see this pattern after this verse and throughout the Old Testament where there is great calamity and confusion. There is judgment. And then out of the bowels of what feels like hell comes the voice of God offering hope. We're going to see that in Isaiah chapter 42. I'm going to start in Isaiah and end in Micah. I want to focus on those two passages to talk about hope. One thing to note about these two prophets, they actually were contemporaries. They were prophesying to the same people. And so it's only fitting to have these two prophets speak speak to us by God's Spirit about the sun. I was joking with them before the service began when we were huddling that every time I opened the Bible to prepare for this message, the first thing that came to my mind, it was not an angel, it was not Gabriel coming down and saying, and here is the message that you will preach on Sunday. Nope. It was a Beatles song. (laughs) I'm like, I wasn't even born then, but okay, I'll go with it. Here comes the sun but not S-U-N, but S-O-N. That there is this sense of anticipation that there is someone coming who has a purpose, and we know he has a purpose because God has sent him. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 42. Let me turn turn there myself. (laughs) Isaiah chapter 42. Verses 1 through 7. This is the first of the servant songs. Now, there are four servant songs in the book of Isaiah. Uh, if you've, you've probably heard me say this before. I love the book of Isaiah. It's one of my favorite books in the entire Bible. Um, the first 39 chapters, however, are pretty stark because it's God having to pronounce judgment on his people. After years and decades and centuries of saying, repent, 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 I am here, let us, let us reason together. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, ultimately, they won't. And so judgment is coming. But then chapters 40 through 66 offer something else. And this is a part of that 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 divine pattern I was talking about where 
yes, there was God's judgment and he must deal with sin. And yet, in that, because of who he is, the heart of the Father is to restore, to redeem. And so some scholars call chapters 40 through 66 the book of hope. Some call it the gospel of Isaiah. But we know that the message of those uh, last 26 chapters are rooted in not leaving the people in their sin, but pointing them forward to someone who's going to come and really, truly set things right from the inside out. And so let's start with verse 1 in chapter 42. It says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout out or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. The Hebrew actually reads closer to, you can't put his wick out, okay? In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he has established justice on the earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope, and the islands simply refer to the specific uh, geographic regions that Isaiah is speaking to along the Mediterranean. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. As you listen, hopefully you could think of some other scriptures as you heard those verses, especially um, verses in, or taken from the gospel, specifically the gospel of Matthew and even the Gospel of Luke. The servant song, for some scholars, refers to Israel. Now, there are definitely places in the Old Testament where God does refer to the entire nation of Israel as his servant. However, one thing to remember about the nature of Old Testament prophecy that it has a dual function. You will have one prophecy that will speak to immediate issues and the people who are hearing it at that time that it's given, but it will also have a long range point where there's something else that it's actually foreshadowing and most likely it will be uh, fulfilled by the Son of God, by the Messiah. And such is the case here. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, verses 18 through 21, he actually quotes the very first four verses, almost word for word. So it is clear that Isaiah 42 is indeed about the Son of God, the one who is coming. And look at what he is doing. He is bringing justice. Now, the word justice has become a dirty word in political circles. I don't care. And the reason why I don't care about that is because justice is God's idea. Justice is not our idea. Justice is God's idea, and in this context, God is sending his servants to make things right in the earth because things were wrong in the earth. Sometimes we want the good news, the good news, but in order to understand why the good news is good, we need to understand why there's bad news. And the bad news is we fell. We disobeyed in the garden. And because of that, there is this break in fellowship with God. That is the bad news. But here comes the sun. Do, 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 do. I'm not going to sing it, Fred, I promise. I promise, Fred, I wouldn't. But here comes the son of God 
to make things right, to bring justice. Not only to bring justice, but he is also, through his teaching, going to show us how to live. It's one thing to be told, these are the right things, do them. But it's another thing when the person teaching you shows you how to do it. I think about that even when I'm dealing with my students. Before I have them write anything, I'm like, I'm going to show you an example of what a strong, debatable, and defensible thesis looks like. And then I'm going to step away, and then I'm going to watch you do it. This is what it must be, and I'm showing you how to do it, and now you do it. I simply follow Jesus' model. I follow God's model of sending his son to show us this is the way, walk in it. And Jesus is going to be that for us, even in the first advent, even as a baby. Because this is news that actually isn't all that new. As we've seen from the very beginning in Genesis 3.15, this was prophesied. The annals of history have been whispering, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. For those of you who have had children, um, those of you who've just had grandchildren, the closer it gets to the birth date, with that time for that child to come forth, it's like the, the anticipation, it just grows and grows and people start losing their minds more and more. But there is this, this, it's almost like this holy frenzy of, it's coming, this baby's coming. Oh my gosh, this, I can't believe it, the baby's coming. But you know where the baby's coming. You live with the person who's giving birth to the baby. You're connected to the person who's giving birth to the baby. In this situation, there are people scattered throughout the centuries who know of this prophecy and are like, well, where in the world? Like, how is he coming? When is he coming? And that is where Isaiah's contemporary, Brother Micah, steps in. Now remember, Micah is prophesying also to essentially the same group of people. They're not next door neighbors, but they are dealing with the same group of people, genuine, generally, and they're having to speak to the same issues. So turn your book, or book, your chapters, move those fingers forward to the book of Micah, and Micah is right after Jonah, I believe. Oh no. Oh, no, that's right, that's right. So there's, there's our friend Obadiah, then there's Jonah, and then there's Micah. The book of Micah, chapter 5. Where Isaiah reminds us that God is going to send his servant to make things right and that that servant is going to be faithful in doing it. That no matter what comes his way, he will not break. That no matter what comes against him to put out the light that he brings, his wick will not be extinguished. Because he is determined to fulfill God's purposes for him in the season that God is giving him to do that. Well, in Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, God gives us the address, the literal town. Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. And here, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor 
bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. God gives us a geographic location of where the servant of the Lord is going to be born. Now, here's something, and I didn't even think about this. There are two Bethlehems. There is a Bethlehem that is connected to the tribe of Zebulun. And then, of course, there is the Bethlehem, um, Ephrathah, that is connected to the tribe of Judah. I want you to note the specificity and the attention to detail that God gives this prophecy. You can't miss it unless you try hard to miss it. He is telling them, even as they face judgment for their sins, that doesn't stop him from offering hope. I know what you're in, I know what you've done, and yes, you're going to pay for it. But I want you to know that there is one who is coming, who I am sending, and he is going to shepherd my people, and he is going to bring healing and restoration for his people and for Gentiles. This is the heart of the Father. This has always been God's heart. This is why I, 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 I get irritated sometimes when I read certain theologians and they're, they're always emphasizing how different Jesus is from the God of the Old Testament. I see no difference. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. God said, I am the Lord and I change not. He doesn't change. His sense of right and justice and truth have not changed, but neither has his desire for mercy, to pour that mercy out on people who he knows are weak in frame and frail. That has not changed either. And that is why, again, here is this holy pattern of, yes, there is judgment. Yes, because I am a just God, I must deal with sin but I'm also a father. I am also your father. I am going to restore you. If you let me. And that's the trick. Our culture today has self-medicated so much, especially with this one phrase, I've heard it, I've said it to people, I've had it said to me, and I know that the intention is good. You are enough. No, you're not. You are not enough. I am not enough. Because if that statement was true, we wouldn't need a savior. It's hard to admit that we are finite human beings and that we don't have all the answers. But one of the blessings of Advent is to remind us that we need that baby. We need that baby. Yesterday, we need that baby today because we understand that that baby is going to one day grow into a man who is going to have a very powerful three-year ministry. That baby is the son of God who was born with a purpose to take away the sins of the world. And when we approach him, admitting that we are limited in our understanding, that we are limited in our ability to change even ourselves completely, Coming to him with that is not sin. Sometimes what keeps us from God is our refusal to do that. 
And when we refuse to recognize our own shortcomings and our deficiencies, it prevents us from opening ourselves to receiving what the infinite one can bring, what only he can give us. The birth of Jesus and the prophesied coming was not, should not have been a surprise. It was only a surprise to those who continued to reject his word or ignore it. Now, here's a funny thing. Remember a few weeks ago I talked about Herod and how Herod was a, a descendant of the Edomites? Even that heathen knew this Bible verse. He knew, he knew enough of it that he tried to kill him. He applied the word the wrong way, he tried to, to snuff out the Son of God. But even he knew that. We can never say that God is unjust, that God is not fair. Actually, maybe he isn't fair because if he was fair, we'd all get what we actually deserve. I'm grateful that he's merciful and that he's kind and that he ever desires for us to be restored, to be healed and redeemed and walking according to the purposes for which he has made each and every one of us. So no, you're not enough. I'm not enough. But boy, is he. And for that, we should be grateful. Now, I wrap this up, wrap this message up with this reminder. And this, the worship songs that Matthew led us in just brought this point home for me even more. Hope in our culture today has become a wish. I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that. I want this to take place. Well, I really want that. And then when those things don't manifest, when they don't come to pass, then we're depressed, we're shaken. We're ready to quit and give up because our hope was in our ability to wish. However good those things were that we wanted, what happens when we don't get what we want? Well, God is still standing by because God has provided for us to get what we need. Now, I know this, this might just sound crazy, but for you boomers in the room, you remember those prophets, the Rolling Stones. What did they say? You can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you get what you need. Well, in this case, we don't have to try anything because God has provided he has provided the greatest hope. And that hope is not a mere proposition about truth and theology. Hope is a person. Hope is a baby who comes because he has been promised. And because our hope is not only in Jesus Christ, but our hope is Jesus Christ, that hope can never fade away. So when we place our faith and our trust in him, no matter what things come, no matter how our expectations ebb and rise, no matter if we're in the valley or on the mountaintop, hope remains because Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, he never fails. And when he is our hope, when he is our hope and our expectation, we will 
not fail either. No, you're not going to be perfect and not make mistakes. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that we will not be handcuffed with the things that hold us back, with the things that keep us from experiencing God's goodness and God's grace and God's healing in times of trouble and strife. That when the worlds shake, we know in whom we have placed our faith, and we know that he has us in the palm of his hand and that he's got us covered. Our hope is not merely in Jesus' first coming. It is in Christ himself, and we are grateful. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. You could have sent a list of rules on how to live and never said another word to us, but you did not do that. You wanted us to be like you, to have your character, Lord God, to walk out our relationship with you, Lord God, in the way that you you planned it from the beginning. And the only way for that to happen, Lord God, was for you to change us from the inside out. We thank you, Lord God, that in healing the breach that our disobedience brought in the garden, that you sent your son. And not only that you sent your son, Lord God, but that you whispered throughout the annals of history, he's coming. He's coming. Oh God, even as we prepare for shopping and spending time with family and friends for Christmas, Lord God, please do not allow this message of your son's first coming to grow stale in our ears. Let it be something, Lord God, that it's not just the same old, same old, but reveal yourself to us in fresh ways, oh God, that we can embrace the realities of what your transforming the power is willing to do, Lord God, for those who you woo with your voice and your heart. Lead us by your spirit, O God. Open our eyes to the hope that is in you and you alone. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.